All right, so we were talking about the differentiation and integration property of the Fourier transform, right? Uh, so if we said KD, the, if the Fourier transform of the signal X of T uh, is X of J omega, uh, then the Fourier transform of the derivative of X uh, is just equal to J omega times X of J omega, right? So you just multiply in the frequency, the differentiation in the, uh, the time domain just results in a multiplication with J omega in the frequency domain, right? Uh, and then we talked about the integration property, which was the, the inverse operation for this, which was, okay, if I integrate uh, from minus infinity to T of what X of tau D tau, right? So in other words, I'm just accumulating, finding the area under the curve um, of X as a function of T. So it's a running accumulation, if you will, right? The Fourier transform for this, uh, we went about saying yeah, this should be the inverse of the derivative. So it should be one upon J omega uh, times X of J omega. Uh, but then based on some intuitive reasoning, we said, okay, this may not be enough. Uh, we, um, so we need to have an extra term, uh, which turned out to be equal to, uh, and this I gave without a proof. So pi times X of zero uh, times delta of omega, right? Where X of zero was a DC component of, of X, right? So this is uh, the integration property. And then we use this integration property uh, to determine the Fourier transform for, uh, for a unit step, right? So that's where I'm going to head now, right? So this is what we concluded, right? So the, the Fourier transform of a unit step uh, is, is just equal to one upon J omega, right? Uh, and uh, plus there's a pi times a delta of omega term, right? So that's what the Fourier transform of the unit step is. Now remember, your unit step is not absolutely integrable, right? And it's clear uh, from the convergence properties that the Fourier transform should not converge, and it these indeed does not converge because the unit step goes to infinity, right? But nevertheless, this uh, comes in handy. This delta form comes in handy uh, in a variety of applications. Now, then I uh, left this off as an exercise. Can you determine the Fourier transform uh, for this uh, a ramp signal, if you will, which is limited between minus one and plus one, right? So this, this intercept here is plus one and X of T is T uh, is, is equal to T when absolute value of T is less than one and zero otherwise. So how many of you were able to do this on your own? Anyone try this out using the integration property or direct application of the Fourier transform relationship? Kisnik, yeah, try. Right, Zen, were you able to do this? No, sir, I didn't actually try this, Zen Mitha, but I didn't try this, sir. Okay. Right, so one of the ways you could do this is, of course, uh, just apply the uh, the Fourier transform relationship directly, right? Uh, but then you, you have to have a, an integration, you would have to use integration by parts there, right? Uh, I'm going to try to explore an alternate methodology which uses the integration property, right? So first off, if I were to write X of T uh, in the form of unit steps, what would that be? I mean, T times of unit step and some difference of unit step. What do you think? Anyone? Uh, sir, I have a video feed uh, frozen. Eye. Frozen? Eye? Uh, what about others? Not for me, sir. That's fine. Right. So maybe, Hassan, you can rejoin. I'm rejoin. All right. So my question here is, could you, uh, can I write this in terms of a nice, I mean, I don't want a, a piecewise relationship. Ji, Hassan. Uh, Shabir. Um, sir, we can. Uh, sir, you don't want a piecewise relationship. You don't want. I don't want a piecewise relationship because oh, I was already given right. I did it something like that's here. Uh, u of t minus u of t minus one multiplied by t. That's for mod of t less than one. Yeah, but that. So uh, what you said is applicable for all t, right? So if I just say that this is t times u of t minus u of t minus one, right? Yeah. Then this is X of T because this is applicable for all T from minus infinity to plus infinity. 
Does that make sense? Because I mean, u of t minus u of t minus one is going to be equal to one between minus one and plus one. So, oh, sorry, there's a. So this is u of t plus one minus u of t minus one. Right. Right. So u of t plus one minus u of t minus one is actually a rectangular pulse from minus one to plus one and a zero outside of this interval. And then you multiply it by t. Right. So this would just be a ramp within minus one and plus one. So that's another way to write this piecewise relationship. Uh, is that clear? Right. So nevertheless, so what I'm going to do is, as I said earlier, instead of applying the direct uh, Fourier transform, uh, forward Fourier transform, I'm going to use, I am going to use the integration property, right? Uh, or the derivative property and, and interchangeably, right? So let me define some function g of t, right? So let some function g of t be equal to the derivative of x of t, right? And this implies that if I inverse this relationship, that means that x of t is actually equal to the integral from minus infinity to t of g of tau d tau. Right? So perhaps if I can take differentiate x and get g, and as we're going to see, finding the Fourier transform of g becomes a lot easier. Right? So let's try to do this. So, um, so let us uh, determine g of t. So if you differentiate x of t, what do you get? So g of t is equal to the derivative of x of t. And this is t times u of t plus one minus u of t minus one. So what is the derivative for this? G m of t plus one to u of t plus one minus u of t minus one plus uh, t into delta t minus one. Uh, so Ahmed, so, so you, you, I, I hear some deltas there, right? So there were some deltas here, right? Um, so yes, product rule. So somebody said product rule as well. Um, and that's what I'm actually going to employ, right? So I'm going to say that okay, this is actually equal to the derivative of t times u of t plus 1 minus u of t minus 1. And plus t times the derivative of u of t plus one minus u of t minus one, right? And, and then it becomes quite easy, right? So it, it, the derivative of t, so I, I, I've used the, the product rule by the way, right? So the derivative of t is just one, and therefore this is u of t plus one minus u of t minus one, and plus t times, what is the derivative of u of t plus one? So what is the derivative of u of t plus one, Manur? Uh, yeah, yeah, so this delta t plus one. Right? And the, the, the derivative of u of t minus one is delta t minus one. Can I simplify this a bit further? Can I simplify this a bit further? Was what do you think? Can I get rid of this t somehow? T multiplied by delta t plus one. And what is this equal to? Right, so, so chat my point. This is not equal to zero. So it will be equal to the value of t at t is equal to minus one. Yes. And what is that value of t at e t equals minus one? So minus one you minus one, right? And then you have to have a delta there as well, right? Yes, sir. Right. So this is this is actually equal to minus delta t plus one. 
right? I just, I just basically use the sampling property um, of the unit impulse. And at the same time, I mean, this thing here is plus one times delta, delta t minus one, right? And therefore, I mean, this simplifies to, this simplifies to this unit step minus u of t minus one, right? And then this is minus delta t plus one. And then there's another minus delta t minus one, right? So, uh, so if I were to sketch this out the slope and, and this would now actually make very, very intuitive sense. Why? Because the actual signal which you had, which was x of t, remember, I mean, which is t here, and this is, uh, this is x of t. The actual signal x of t was equal to zero all the way up to minus one. And then at minus one, it had a discontinuity, right? And it reached up to minus one, went on a ramp, right? And then got back to zero at plus one. And here's a minus one. Kind of the array. See? The straight line would be erased. The right straight line would be erased, the left straight line would be increased. So, Emma, it looks like you're outside somewhere. I cannot hear you properly. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Right. So, so the, if this is x of t, right? And if you just look at this expression, uh, you, you look at this curve, right? And I were to ask you to, to calculate the slope of this curve, right? At each and every time instance, what would you get? Right? If you feed this into into a system, which all it does is it just evaluates the slope of this input. What do you get at the output in the time domain, right? So what you get in the time, uh, in the output in the time domain is G of T, right? So this is T and this is G of T. My question is, okay, I'm gonna try to do it two ways, right? So the first way is, I'm just going to take a look at the um, at the curve here, right? At the curve here, and just see if I were to compute the slope of this curve as a function of time, what would I get? And then I'm going to compare that with the the expression that I got here, right? So I, I and, and I'll see if both of them are going to turn out to be exactly the same, right? From analysis and from observation, right? So. Um, uh, it, uh, Ibrahim, uh, you say you're, you're almost there. Omar is also there, right? So Ibrahim, if you can unmute yourself and maybe uh, explain out your logic, what you're thinking. Remember, this is minus one and this is plus one, right? Mic issues, okay. Uh, Omar? it would be zero up till minus one, then it would have a negative infinity slope because right. there's so, a dis discontinuity. Okay, so it's it would be zero all the way up to minus one because, I mean, signal is not changing, it stays flat, right? So therefore the slope is flat as well, right? And then at minus one, there's a discontinuity and the, and the, and the, and the signal suddenly changes from zero to minus one and infinitesimally small duration, right? And it turns out okay, that that's actually corresponds to a unit step. And if you take the different derivative of that, you're actually going to get a, a, a delta function, right? Which is in the negative direction because that's, that's where the slope is. It's a negative infinity, but in a very, very small duration, right? And that's why there's an impulse here. I mean, this is just from observation. And the height of this is, is minus one. Okay? Uh, Umar, what happens between minus one and plus one? So we have a constant slope of okay. one. It's a constant and slope one. of one, right? So between minus one and plus one, it's a constant slope of, of plus one, right? And then what happens at plus one? Another negative impulse of minus one. Another negative impulse because the signal goes from plus one to zero in an infinitesimally small duration. Right? And that's why there's an impulse there. 
which is just by looking at the visual uh, visual graph you can uh, you can you can judge that this must be the derivative which we've actually verified through mathematical analysis as well right and it turns out that uh, this g of t if you compare uh, this thing here this equation here this would indeed turn out to be equal to that right so there is a uh, Uh, there's a this is equal to minus this is equal to plus one between minus and one and plus one and then there are two negative impulses one residing at minus one and then another one residing at plus one. Okay, now if this is G of T, if this is G of T, so let me uh, write down what G of T is once again. So if G of T is is equal to U of T plus one minus U of T minus one, so this is a square pulse between minus one and plus one. and then there are some delta functions t plus 1 and minus delta t minus 1 what would be the fourier transform for this so uh g daniel aapka hath khada hai is you have a question or do you have a question sir yeah please question sir ye ye minus 1 aur plus 1 pe um delta bhi hai aur aur ek ठीक है, is that clear दाने? Yes sir. That's an excellent question, but but I can resolve this by just saying कि जी minus one पे plus epsilon पे ये रिजाइड करती है, similarly plus one minus epsilon तक जाती है, right? अच्छा, my question now is what would g of j omega be, right? So I what I would do here is I would just compute the Fourier transform uh, first of all uh, for this, which is a square pulse, and that's something we've done actually by the way, right? In one of the examples and we just apply the definition yes hasan and we've done that we've applied the definition i think in, in one of the very first examples or the one of the uh, first examples we did um, in in the first lecture on fourier transform and i'm just going to write down the result the result turns out to be equal to 2 sin omega divided by omega if i'm not mistaken yeah right so this is the fourier transform uh, for this unit impulse of uh, of this square pulse right What about the Fourier transform of delta t plus one? So, what is the Fourier transform for this? Delta t plus one. So, what is the Fourier transform of delta t? Okay, delta the Fourier transform of delta t is one, and what I do then is I have a delta t plus one, right? Right. Therefore, this is shifting in time. So, I apply the shifting in time property. And as people point out in the chat box as well, this turns out to be exponent and exponential. E used by j omega t, which is plus e used by j omega t. Uh, and then there's a minus sign here, and the Fourier transform for this is going to be e raised to power minus j omega t, right? And consequently, um, so this is this g of j omega complex or real? Tell me. Is this complex or real? Right. So, uh, why is it complex? So why is it real? Hafsa, what do you think? Or Talha? So, Maz, you want to say something? So, वो एक e की पार्ट j omega t है और minus j omega t है. तो जो जे साइन वाला पार्ट है इमेजिनरी पार्ट दे विल कैंसिल आउट एक्सेलरेट राइट बिकॉज़ वन इज द कॉन्जुगेट ऑफ द अदर राइट एंड व्हेन यू ऐड टू कॉम्प्लेक्स नंबर व्हेन यू ऐड अ कॉम्प्लेक्स नंबर टू इट्स कॉन्जुगेट द इमेजिनरी पार्ट्स कैंसिल आउट एंड यू आर गोइंग टू बी लेफ्ट विद द रियल पार्ट ओनली राइट एंड इट डी टर्न्ड आउट टू बी अ रियल एंड आई कैन अप्लाई एक्चुअली द आइलर्स आइडेंटिटी राइट सो दिस इज एक्चुअली इक्वल टू टू टाइम्स कोसाइन और एक्चुअली सो आई my bad here this is not t here i mean cannot be a function of time right so this is my bad right this is just j omega 
and there's a T naught here, T naught was actually equal to one, right? Somebody pointed out in the chat box, right? Okay, so this is cosine omega, right? Now, G of J omega is not what we were interested in, by the way, right? We were interested in finding out the Fourier transform of X of J omega, where uh, X of T, so since X of T equals integral from minus infinity to T G of tau D tau, remember G was the derivative of X, and therefore X is the integral of G, right? Um, this implies that X of J omega is related to the Fourier transform of G by one upon G omega, J omega times G of J omega uh, plus pi times G of zero times delta of omega. Right, so there's a, uh, why do you think Daniel should, it should be a sign? Minus with sign I mean, remember there's a there's a minus sign outside, right? So I take the minus common, right? And then this is e raised by j omega plus e raised by minus j omega. That's right. Acha. So what is g of zero here? Hafsa, what is g of zero? Right, so Ibrahim says G of zero is uh, minus two. Oh, so Ibrahim, why do you say minus two? So let me talk to Ibrahim. Uh, Ibrahim come with Mike come myself, right? Oh, sorry. Right, so the, the answer turns out to be zero actually. So Abdullah, why do you think it's a zero? How do you how did you come up with zero? Right, excellent. Right. So you use lopitals, right? That's one way you could one thing that you could do. Or you could also just look at um I mean G of zero is just simply the area under the curve for for this thing here, this curve here. Right, and it's clearly that the green pulse, the area under the curve for that is two, and the area under the deltas is minus two, and that's why they all the, both of them cancel, and that's another way to figure out that g of zero must be zero, right? But nevertheless, what you do is is perfectly fine as well. You apply the lopitals um, on the first term, uh, that turns out to be two at omega equals zero, and then it's cosine omega, of course, at omega equals zero is one, right? So therefore, g of zero is zero, right? Uh, and therefore. Uh, my answer turns out to be equal to, so this is, let me explicitly say this out, this is equal to zero. And therefore the, the result that I get is two sine omega divided by J omega squared minus two cosine omega divided by J omega. And this is X of J omega, right? So this is, the result that I get. Now, you see this is the Fourier transform is real or imaginary or complex or what do you think? Right, so Hassan, uh, Hassan asks, and asks a very good question which is, which says KG, G of J omega is equal to J omega X of J omega, indeed it is, right? And, but this does not imply that the X of J omega is equal to one upon J omega times G of J omega. This is wrong. Why is that? And, and, and when we started talking about the integration property, we said that there's a reason for this, right? And the reason for this is you're not sure what happens to omega equals zero, right? So you need to be careful about what happens at omega equals zero, excellent, right? Uh, and that's why there's a, the, you see, I mean this, there, here's the extra term, right? And that just plays a part 
at omega equals zero. It turns out in this case, we're all good because there's no DC component for, uh, for G and therefore it's indeed equal to one upon J omega times, but in general, it is not, right? So you, uh, you need to be careful here, right? All right. So the question uh, I was getting at is KG, uh, is this real or is this complex or is this imaginary? Purely imaginary, X of J omega, right? It's purely imaginary, right? So it's, it is indeed purely imaginary. Why is it purely imaginary? Should it be purely imaginary? Right? Should it be purely imaginary? Yes, why should it be purely imaginary? It's not only about Ibrahim odd function, but also the real, right? It's purely imaginary since X of T was real and odd, right? So it was real as well as odd. And that's why the Fourier transform turns out to be uh, purely imaginary as it should, right? So if, if, you, if you do all of these evaluation at the end of the day, your Fourier transform does not turn out to be purely imaginary. That means you must have made a mistake, right? Somewhere, right? Moreover, X of J omega is you can verify it's actually also odd. And that's easy to verify. Sine omega is odd, omega squared is even, so therefore odd divided by even is odd. And cosine omega is even, omega is odd, and therefore even divided by odd is also odd, right? And odd plus odd is odd, right? Uh, so everything clicks, everything fits together. Okay. Any question about this before I move ahead? All right, no questions. All right, so let me uh, talk about the next property uh, and what property were we at? Let's see. So it's property number four, All right? So this is now property number five, which is uh, which is time and frequency scaling. Okay, what do I mean by time and frequency scaling? What I mean by that is the first thing is, okay, if X of T has a Fourier transform X of J omega, the usual notation, the question is, okay, what is the Fourier transform of X of A T? And of course, I mean, we are given the fact that A is real, right? A must be real. Okay. Uh, Jee Abdullah. Uh, so it will be same, only the frequency uh, omega will change like A multiply over omega squared. Okay. And how do you, um, I mean, what's the basis of, of your conclusion? Uh, I compared it to A case like we did in uh, oh, previous see. sections. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, there's something else that changes here as well. Right. So in order to uh, completely characterized, we'd have to dig deep uh, and look at the definitions, right? So just, just try to derive it the same way we did this for, for the Fourier series thing, right? And we'll find out today that there's some nuance there that, that, that needs to be scaled, right? Um, I mean, just as a, as a side note here, um, can I say, Kiji, I mean, when, when I explicitly point out that A is real, right? Would a complex A have made sense? I mean, would a complex A have made sense? I mean, we're talking about complex numbers all the way, right? Right, so would a complex scaling make sense here as far as our discussions are concerned? Actually, uh, anyone who says yes, so Hassan says no. And then says yes. Right, so it's, it's, it's both ways. What do you think uh, other people? Okay, Abdullah, what do you mean by make, make frequency complex? 
इंडिपेंडेंट वेरियबल विच इज टाइम एक्सेस time axis we've never talked about the time axis being complex uh, we've not never talked about uh, the function being uh, the, the signal being a function of an independent variable which is complex i mean that doesn't make sense as far as we're concerned right so the independent variables variable always have to be real so t is always real and therefore at must also be real so a complex a as far as we're concerned would not make sense theek hai please and go ahead you had a question उसमें Right. we've just talked about an x dimension right which is the time axis and the signal yes. is complex right humne yes x axis ka kabhi complex ke bare mein baat nahi ki but if you're saying it is complex so that's where you're headed and that's not what we we've, we've talked about okay so time is always real exactly so the time axis as far as we are concerned is always real right so that's why a is all i've explicitly noted this down that a is real All right. Now let's move ahead, Kaji. Acha, how do you do this time and frequency? So what happens to the Fourier transform? As as somebody pointed out in the chat box as well. In order to find this out, uh, what I'm going to do is I am just going to just plug this in into the definition, and that definition is k y of j omega is just simply so. Let's say y of t is equal to x of a t. So then the Fourier transform of this y is just simply I just plug in. X of a t here, and then this is e to the power minus j omega t d t and minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, um, uh, Ali uh, Gardezi. So, how, what do you think? Uh, in order to, for me to bring this to a regular Fourier transform relationship, what do I do? How do I make this um, into tau? um so um um so make sure the when in doubt always apply a yeah? change of variables change of variables change of variables right change of variables right so i could just use the change of variables tau equals at right um and so this i may skip some steps here so this is going to be equal to 1 upon a integral from minus infinity to plus infinity this is x of tau and this is e raised to power minus j omega by a tau times d tau when a is greater than 0 right and that should be simple enough because if a is positive that means when tau when t equals plus infinity tau is also plus infinity Right, the sign remains the same for for t and tau, right? And similarly, uh, when t is minus infinity, tau is also minus infinity. And that's only the case when a is positive, right? And for the case when a is negative, what 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 about that case here? So when a is negative, what I get here is one upon a, and this is plus infinity. at the bottom and minus infinity at the top right other than that everything remains the same and this is minus j omega by a tau times d tau and if i can so this is if i pull the minus sign out the limits change minus infinity plus infinity then this is x of tau e raised to power minus j omega by uh, omega by a 
times tau d times d tau, right? So what do I have here then? And then this is, by the way, this is the case when a is less than zero, right? Um, and let me just point out here a is not equal to zero. We're considering only the case when a is not equal to zero, right? So can I lump this together? Can I lump this together into a single? So it, when A is positive, I have a one upon A. When A is negative, I have a minus one upon A, right? Can I write this down as, an, as a single equation? Yes, Tala, please go ahead. Tala, bole. Sir, one ki upper yam at minus infinity or dusri sa, yani dono ki upper yam wo dusre ki yor yam at minus infinity ke to hum inko combine kar sakte hain. Kisna combine kar sakte hain? That's what I'm saying. Ek me negative sign aare, ek me negative sign nahi aara. So just add हो जाएंगे ना यानी हम plus infinity से minus infinity वो यानी okay. So what, what I'm saying is that there are two cases here. One case is corresponds to the case when a is positive, a is a parameter, right? And the other case hmm. corresponds to the case when a is negative. It's वो फिर बस modulus लगा देंगे. Modulus लगा लेंगे, right? And as as excellent, right? So Maz also says this. Uh, other people say this as well, right? So this is. I actually misinterpreted the question. Okay, so this is one upon absolute of a. Got the law, right? So this is, and and the integral is minus infinity to plus infinity, and this is x of tau e raised to power minus j omega by a tau times d tau. And what do I have now here in the inside the integral? Right. So was, ये क्या? Mas Zemet, the Fourier transform of x of tau. Not exactly. Right? There's a slight, slight bit of a nuance here. I mean, this is not exactly the Fourier transform. Right? So excellent. Right? So as as Daniel points out, this is equal to x of j, and instead of omega, you have omega by a. Right? So that's what it really is, right? So therefore, this is equal to one upon absolute of a x of j omega by a. Right. So let me let me write down what the conclusion is, and and I'm going to talk about yet what is the intuitive sense of what we just did, right? So what we're saying now is that there's a signal, and if you scale in time with a. So the Fourier transform that you get is one upon absolute of a x of j omega by a, right? So this is what we obtained by some mathematical manipulation. Now, can somebody try to make sense of what this represents, right? And in order to do this, let, let's just consider two cases, right? So let's consider the case first uh, where. Uh, there's a is um, let's say a is um, is positive, right? Uh, and it's greater than one, right? So if it's a is greater than one, what do you have in the time domain? Do you have compression or expansion? Right? If t if a is greater than one, right? So you, whatever the signal was, you're actually compressing that in time, right? So this is a compression in the time domain. And some part of it we've actually seen in some one, some of one of the earlier examples. Example square pulses, we talked right? And what happens in the frequency domain? Frequency domain may there's expansion in the frequency domain. Excellent, right? So there's expansion in the frequency domain. Sir, ये expansion वाला frequency domain में कैसे expansion है ये थोड़ा clear करते हैं। Right, because I mean, if a is greater than one, then one upon a जो है is going to be less than one, right? जी Right, it's going to be between zero and one, right? So okay. 
यहां पे स्केलिंग किस और 1.8 से स्केलिंग हो रही है फ्रीक्वेंसी डोमेन में राइट हाय अच्छा ठीक राइट सो दैट मींस द स्केलिंग इज बाय बाय अ फैक्टर व्हिच इज लेस देन 1 एंड दैट मींस एक्सपेंशन ठीक है ठीक है राइट सो कंप्रेशन इन द टाइम डोमेन if you if you take up a four year if if you take up a time domain signal and you compress that in a time domain what happens in the frequency domain is that the frequency spectrum expands right now my question here is have we seen something earlier in some of the posts that i that i put up as well for especially for audio signals which would make sense now given this mathematical analysis koi kahi aisi cheez dekhi thi i think the very first post i actually posted about transformations in audio signals right i put up my voice right i put up my speech and i put up a compressed by a factor of 2 and i put up an expanded by a factor of 2 so when i compress my voice by a factor of 2 what happened what what did you observe right so if you if you uh, and uh, It's, it's the pitch increased exactly right omar says pitch increased so as i as i compress in the time domain right which basically means i am playing the sound faster than the regular rate we, what you would observe is that the pitch increases and now we know why the pitch increases i mean uh, wahan pe humne we we try to to make some intuitive sense out of this but now this is a this is a crisp uh, rigorous analysis of why the pitch increases when there's a compression the time went that because the the spectrum expands now you will have higher frequency components contributing to the to the time domain signal and that's why the pitch increases and there's a vice versa right so the second case of course is uh, for the case when um zero is less than a is less than 1 right so this for is expansion in the time domain i would urge you to go back to lms and and all the things are there all the samples are there uh, this would correspond to uh, compression in the time domain uh, in the frequency domain right and indeed when you play a sound very slowly a uh, slowly than its regular rate right the 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 sound becomes much duller or which means that the, the pitch decreases right and that's because there's a compression going on in the frequency domain right so that's this is now a crisp proof earlier we said kitty or or maybe an intuitive proof we have kuch de sakte hain and that intuitive proof is if there's a sine side and you're compressing the sine side the frequency of that sine side is supposed to increase and 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 vice versa right and since fourier just says kitty everything is made up of complex exponentials so all of the complex exponentials that were contributing to the original time domain when the time domain expands the the frequency of of those exponentials decrease right right because it's expanding you're pulling it out and the frequency therefore decreases right so that's intuitive uh, intuition to go along with with the analysis that we just did okay A any questions here Right. Now, uh, there's an entire section. Excuse uh, me, sir. The. There's a by one upon a multiply or a. Yeah. उसका loudness वगैरह से उसका relation है क्या है? Sound के साथ जब आप उसको relate करते हैं. Right. उसका उसका energy के साथ तालु क्या उसका? Right. Would that translate to the volume of sound? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's 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 just say कि जी टोटल एनर्जी को आपको क्या हुआ राइट right? इसी जब आप एक फ्रीक्वेंसी एक टाइम डोमेन सिग्नल था राइट right? जो कि इतना बड़ा था राइट right? उसकी कुछ ना कुछ एनर्जी थी राइट right? आपने उसको कंप्रेस कर दिया तो उसकी एनर्जी ओवर दैट इंटायर टाइम पीरियड फ्रॉम माइनस इन्फिनिटी प्लस इन्फिनिटी कम होगी या ज्यादा होगी यानी एक चीज थी ना जो दस सेकंड के लिए प्ले हो रही थी राइट right? आपने वही चीज पांच सेकंड में प्ले कर दिया राइट द एनर्जी फॉर दैट इज गोइंग टू डिक्रीज बाय फैक्टर सम फैक्टर ठीक है एंड एज वी गोइंग टू सी पार्सिबल्स रिलेशनशिप आगे भी आएगी तो दिस 1 अपॉन a हैज टू डू विद द एनर्जी 
has to be conserved maybe or, or it has to be uh, I mean is, is going to decrease that's why one upon a appears at, at the front right uh, loudness say uska taluk I don't think loudness is okay right so uh, you can think of this way as well right so I give you a sine side a cosine which plays for some 10 seconds right and just a tone right and then I say that this core time domain may compress it. So what do you think would happen when you compress it in the time domain, right? It would play for five seconds, right? But the I know that the transformation in the uh, time axis does not change the amplitude of the signal, right? So the volume is is related to that amplitude. Therefore, the volume is not going to increase. It's just that it's going to play for a smaller amount of time, right? And that has okay. to do with the energy is come out because it was a little bit more. Right, so this is certain sort of, sort of a nuance here. Uh, jo, perhaps when you do Parseval's relationship uh, is, is going to become clearer, right? But other than that, mathematically, all of that makes sense because I mean, we go went through that analysis, right? And 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 this one upon A appears because of the substitution that we did, okay? So I may come back to this. So, so remind me uh, when we do the parsables or perhaps in the next class. Okay, uh, any other questions? So what I was saying is Katie, uh, there's, a, uh, there's an entire big section on your textbook about duality. Um, and we've touched upon that in some examples we did, which was Katie, there's a, there's a duality between the time domain and the frequency domain. In the sense KD, uh, we, we saw Katie Fourier transform of a square pulse is a sink and the Fourier transform of a sink is a square, right? So there's, there appears to be a duality. At the same time, if there's compression in the time domain, there's expansion in the frequency domain and the vice versa, right? So there appears to be some sort of duality. And the reason, primary reason for that is, as uh, one of you actually pointed out, was came uh, the Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform relationships are quite similar, right? Except that there's a one upon two pi in one of those uh, and the plus G omega T and then the other one is minus G omega T, right? And that's why the duality is there. Uh, and I am not there, for, I'm not going to, to go in a lot of details, dig into those. I'm gonna skip over the, all, of the, all, all of that section, right? Uh, but the reason why I'm just mentioning is you need to be aware that there's some sort of duality uh, between the time domain um, and the frequency domain. I mean, the kind that we've actually touched upon in some uh, very, very in broad brush terms. Right, uh, in a hand waving sort of a manner in one of the earlier examples as well. Right, so I'm skipping over that section. All right, and I'm now yeah. going to. Dimas. Yeah, a less than zero because of the modulus less sign considered in here. Right. So okay, excellent. Right. So what happens if a is less than zero? So that's a good point. Right. So when when let's say minus one is less than a is less than zero. What will happen Negative time domain with a negative mu scaling will happen. Right. So, like, what about uh, would there be some compression? No. Just one minute. Why is it? Or some expansion? Compre compression. Compression will happen. Expansion will happen. Ah. Oh. Ha, expansion. Expansion, and there are actually two things that are going to be going on. Right, there's a, there's a flipping first. They flip flip it, and then there's an expansion, right? So there are two things that go on. Thank you. Right, and 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 so that's why I did not uh, explicitly cover this, but that there's the two, um, which is straightforward. Okay, there's not only uh, expansion, but also flipping or time reversal, right? Just keep what I say. Frequency domain, what will happen? Frequency domain may be there will be a, a flipping, which is a time, which is a frequency reversal, mm -hmm. and then there is compression. Okay, so so let me let me this so, so uh, especially shall I talk about this case, right? So so is flipping so, se fark padega, sir? Right, so flipping is just a theoretical construct, right? Mm -hmm. um, in practical signals, flipping ka matlab kya hota hai? Uh, we can't really say because I mean there's no zero there. Take. 
right? So there always has to be around a certain axis. Okay. So when a okay. equals minus one, the same thing applies, right? Indeed. So and this would be x or minus t. What would this be equal to? This one of the modulus absolute of minus one, which is just one, and then hmm. this was be x or minus g omega. Minus g omega. Right. So when a equals minus one. Uh, you actually use the scaling property to just find out that the reversal in the time domain implies a reversal in the frequency domain. Frequency, right? And a equals minus two, baby. Let's say as an example, right? So this would be uh, four here. So it's one upon two x of minus j omega by two. And you see what's going on. I mean, here in the time domain there is. Um, there is compression and time reversal, mm. and in the frequency domain, we can. There's expansion and time. And expansion or time frequency reversal. Frequency reversal. Take okay, a flipping. Right, right. Straightforward to conclude all of this from what we've done. So, no, so, no. Frequency reversal ka basically main matlab kya hota hai? Matlab baaki cheez time reversal to samal lagti hai. Yeah. Like frequency reversal hota hai number of cycles per second. Frequency. So, usko reverse kya sikhiye kar? So, uh, I think I, I I sort of touched upon this uh, earlier as well. Okay. In order to answer this, you need to be aware of what is the meaning of negative frequencies. Yes. Right. When you say that the frequency is the number of cycles per second, so then how can you have negative cycle number of cycles per second? Why not? Right. So, actually, a frequency is not the number of cycles per second. Right. So, frequency. Oh. Okay. Or or rather, chale. uh the absolute value of the frequency indicates what the number of cycles per second is and the and the sign of the frequency indicates what the direction of rotation is direction okay right so you see it is about okay. j omega t where omega is positive it rotates like this in in a three dimensional space and is from minus j omega t rotates the other way around is in the opposite direction just... it is only when you add of an exponential with a positive frequency with an exponential in the with a negative frequency that you get a real signal to matlab jaise humne complex exponential mein dekha tha omega ka sign change karne matlab sigma ka jo sign tha j us wo change karne se rotation exactly matlab so it's the same way with the frequency as well yes bilkul and but my exactly wohi wali frequency hai right it is but j omega t is 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 our basic building block right theek hai but the the point i want to stress once again is okay those negative frequencies are necessary for you to obtain a real signal because that's a cosine omega not t a right cosine omega not t a what is it made up of it is made up of a e raised by plus j omega not t and e raised by minus j omega not t yeah. had you not had that e raised by minus j omega not t your you would not have a real signal okay तो रियल सिग्नल्स बनाने के लिए नेगेटिव फ्रीक्वेंसीज लाजमी है ओके राइट थैंक यू ओके ऑल राइट सो वे वाज आई सो नेक्स्ट प्रॉपर्टी व्हिच वी सेड तो इज देयर अनदर क्वेश्चन जी सर हमारा कोर्स ये जो फ्रीक्वेंसी वाली डोमेन में है कि नेगेटिव रोटेशंस वगैरह इसका मतलब लाइक हमारा स्कोप में है ये इस कोर्स के लिए या फिर नहीं है क्यों नहीं है अभी सर सबसे पहले हमने क्या किया था नेगेटिव रोटेशन क्वेश्चन जी सर सर मैं क्वेश्चन था कि हम लोग इमेजिनरी सिग्नल्स को हेयर डिटेक्ट नहीं कर सकते किसी तरह क्या नहीं करते सॉरी फिर से कहिए डिटेक्ट नहीं कर सकते लाइक कोई व्हाट डू यू मीन बाय डिटेक्ट नहीं कर सकते वो आपने कहा था कि uh, हमें कॉस होने के लिए उसका कॉम्प्लेक्स जो है वो जीरो होना चाहिए या yeah. तो अगर कोई प्योरली कॉम्प्लेक्स हो या फिर इसमें किसी भी सिग्नल से कॉम्प्लेक्स पार्ट हो या yeah. तो उसकी साउंड हमें नहीं आएगी लाइक राइट सो देखें रियल वर्ल्ड सिग्नल्स आर रियल राइट सो इमेजिनरी सिग्नल्स आर अ कंस्ट्रक्ट 
और दिस कॉम्प्लेक्स सिग्नल्स आर अ कॉन्स्ट्रक्ट राइट वो कहाँ पे यूज होते हैं आई आई कैन टॉक अबाउट दैट पहस आफ्टर द क्लास ठीक है ये एक और डायमेंशन में निकल जाएगी सो परहेप्स एट द एंड ऑफ दिस चैप्टर एज वेल आई आई टच अपॉन दिस के कहाँ पे हम यूज कर सकते हैं रडार में और कम्युनिकेशन में ओके बट साउंड सिग्नल्स साउंड सिग्नल्स आर रियल ऑलवेज ठीक है अच्छा सो दिस प्रॉपर्टी इज चले मैं आई एम नॉट श्योर इफ दिस इज इन द बुक और नॉट सो आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टच अपॉन दिस डिफ्रेंसिएशन इन द फ्रीक्वेंसी डोमेन which is uh say kid if x of t has a fourier uh transform equal to x of j omega what is the inverse fourier transform of j omega or sorry fourier fourier transform of d by d omega x of j omega right so we have said we 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 have talked about kitty if you differentiate in the frequency domain right what happens in the uh, sorry if you differentiate in the time domain what happens in the frequency domain is you just multiply the frequency domain with j omega right now i'm asking the reverse question get the frequency domain ko fourier transform ko main main differentiate kar lu so then time domain mein kya milta right so how do i how do i go about this i mean this is like something which i put up on slack slack as well on in discussions okay इसको प्रूव करें एंड यू हैव एवरी थिंग हियर राइट सो दिस कुड प्रोहेप्स बी इफ आई हैव नॉट डिस्कस दिस हियर आई कुड यू टू प्रूव दिस इन दिन द एग्जाम फॉर इंस्टेंस बिकॉज इट यूज द सेम प्रिंसिपल्स राइट सो हाउ डू आई गो अबाउट दिस डेफिनेशन वॉट वॉट डेफिनेशन दान यार Right, excellent, excellent. Right, so uh, x of j omega, I know by definition is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity, x of t e raised to the minus j omega t times d t. Let me differentiate both sides with respect to omega, the x of j omega, and this is equal to what? This is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity, um, and this is x of t times Minus j t times e raised to the minus j omega t times d t, right? So because I'm differentiating with respect to omega, I can take that inside the integral because the integral is with respect to t, right? So I I, I can take it inside, right? Um, and then I say that this is minus infinity to plus infinity um, minus j times t times x of t times e raised to the minus j Omega t times d t. This is actually equal to the derivative of x of j omega. Right. So what can I say about the inverse Fourier transform of this derivative of x? Yeah, Kela. So let me use the same color. Okay, I will get. Okay. So. Right, so this is uh, who who asked this question? Uh, Ibrahim, you did right on Slack. All right, so clearly, okay, this and this are the Fourier transform pairs, right? In other words, okay, the Fourier transform for this must be this here. Right, so I mean, just based on our, our discussions uh, from earlier as well. So this is minus j times t uh, x of t. The Fourier transform for that is x of j omega. Right, and I claim here yeah, this is actually this implies that t times x of t. The Fourier transform for that. Is just j 
sorry, uh, yeah, j times d by d omega x of j omega. So how did I come up with this second expression? Right. So like in one upon j, uh, Abdullah, why one upon j? So what property uh, so, have I used? Uh, so if you multiply but multiply the numerator and denominator by j, yeah. So in the numerator we get minus one, and in the numerator we get j, which is equal to minus j. Exactly. So I've used linearity, right? Okay. If I multiply anything in the time domain with a constant, right? So the frequency domain is multiplied by the same constant, right? So I've used linearity here, right? So so this is a result that we will actually end up using. The reason why I wanted to do this is we will use in some applications or some examples in particular. All right, TKD. So this is uh, was property number six. Uh, let me briefly talk about, because it's quite simple, property number seven, uh, which is frequency shifting. Right. So what I mean by this is, okay, remember, uh, we said, KG, if there's a, there's a shifting in the time domain, what happens in the frequency domain? Frequency domain may, you multiply that by e raised to the power uh, minus j omega t naught, right? Where t naught was a shift, right? What happens if there's a shifting in the frequency domain, right? Um, and I would rather say, let me go it in a straightforward fashion and say, KG, what if there's a time domain signal x of t, which has a Fourier transform of x of j omega? What if I multiply x of t with e raised to part j, some constant omega naught times t times x of t, and then take the Fourier transform for that? What would this be equal to? Right, Hassan says x of j omega minus omega naught. Right, Hassan, can you elaborate on why you think this is the answer? So just an intuition from uh, like we did in Fourier series for okay. the case. Right, excellent. Right, or you could also apply this intuition because of the duality there as well. Right, we say that the time domain is shifting, करते हैं तो frequency domain में exponential से multiply करें. अब यहाँ हम exponential time domain में अगर multiply करें so perhaps you should have a shift in the, the frequency domain. And this is a, indeed what happens. And we can, we can verify this from rigorous analysis. Um, and we take it very, very easily, which is y of j omega, I just apply the definition, is equal to uh, this. Uh, and let's say this is y of t. And this is e raised to by j omega naught t times x of t times e raised to a minus j omega t times dt. This is the definition. And I just do some manipulations. Say so this is x of t. This is e raised to the power minus j omega minus omega naught times t times dt. And this is simply equal to what? This is indeed what Hassan said, right? x of j omega minus omega naught. Right. Right. Any any questions here? Okay. So we have uh, ten minutes. So let me talk about this uh, Parseval's relationship. So, so what was Parseval's relationship in the Fourier series, right? So in the Fourier series, I the power in the time domain is actually equal to, uh, if I take all the Fourier series coefficients, I take the absolute square and sum them up and they're gonna be the same. That's what the Parseval relationship is. A similar thing holds true uh, for, for aperiodic signals as well, right? So once again, uh, my question here is KG, the question I wanna answer is, Right. So what is this energy equal to?
in terms of the x of j omega right in other words can i use the fourier transform alone to compute the energy in a in a signal right so i have for, for instance let's say i would just have a um only have the fourier transform available i don't want to compute the energy in the signal can i use the fourier transform alone right and daniel says uh or okay, do you have a sum of x of j omega absolute squared right x of j omega remember is it takes one values over a continuum of omega right there's no k omega not there's no discrete set of values or discrete set of frequency over which this holds true but rather a continuum of values right so uh that needs to be taken into account and as people now are saying it perhaps so integral yes the answer is integral but that's just intuition we want to come up with a with a proof for that right so let's say kiti you are parsival now and you're trying to uh, derive that relationship right um daniel uh, omega equals k omega not it does not make sense either because we don't have harmonics now right we don't have harmonics uh, and therefore as mas suggests yes we will go by the definition now right so what i'm my objective here is to try to see kr can i bring this into a form uh, which is a function of x of j omega right so let me do the first step for you and see kg ab you put yourself in parsival's shoes right so this is the result uh, that is attributed to parsival and maybe talha uh, you can you can look help us here to see kg what was the history behind it i mean it was very very nice post of kg theek hai talha right so the first step is x of t times x conjugate of t right all right good right thank you tala right so um x of t times x conjugate of t right that's absolute x of t absolute squared right how can i relate this to x of j omega if i were to put this x of j omega here what do i do any anyone who has any ideas let's let's no ideas i just have just any random educated guess what do you think right so i know that x of t is 1 upon 2 pi integral from minus infinity to plus infinity yes x in daniel inverse for you right so this is equal to x of j omega e is to power j omega t d omega right uh, and if i take the conjugate on both sides what happens x conjugate of t is equal to 1 upon 2 pi integral from minus infinity to plus infinity x conjugate of j omega And e is to the minus j omega t d omega, yeah, because I right. So I just take the conjugate of everything inside, right? So I will plug this back in. So that let's say this is two. Uh, plug this in equation one, and then what I get is that the this is. dt equals minus into infinity plus infinity x of t and i'm going to substitute x conjugate of t here right the x conjugate of t is 1 upon 2 pi and then there is an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of what x conjugate of j omega times e raised to the minus j omega t times d omega right So this essentially is x conjugate of t, right? Remember, this is a function of t. I mean, omega goes out. I mean, omega is um, after you've done the cal the 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 integral, it's not a function of omega anymore, right? And here you have e raised to the power minus. Uh, so this, sorry, this is a plus. Right. 
So this is a e raised to power. Right, so no, there's no e. Right, so this is dt. Okay. Right, so this is essentially, right, this entire thing here, all I've done is, I've just plugged in x conjugate of t here. Right? What do we do next? Aap kya kare? Anyone who has ideas of what we could do? Give you a few seconds to Right, so I can pull at one to one upon two pi. Right, that's easy. Right, and then there's an integral here minus infinity plus infinity. And this is x conjugate of j omega. I can switch the order of the integrals. Right, uh, and then this is an integral over time minus infinity plus infinity x of t e raised to power minus j omega t. So all I've done is I've switched the order of the integrals. Right, so. times d omega, right? So what do I have inside the pink brackets here now? So what is inside the pink brackets? Right, so x of d omega, excellent, right? So this is one upon two pi minus infinity to plus infinity. This is x conjugate of j omega times x of j omega, right? So what is this equal to? So this is equal to one upon two pi minus infinity to plus infinity x of j omega absolute squared times d omega. Right, so this is the energy. And this is the Parseval relationship, by the way. Let me box this up. So this is an extremely important result, right? And we just says, KJ, if you were to compute the energy in a time domain signal or the time domain energy, you could do it in the frequency domain as well, right? If you have the Fourier transform available, all you do is you compute the absolute squared of the Fourier transform and you find the area of the curve and then scale it by two pi and that will give you the energy inside the, inside the time domain signal, right? So using just knowing the Fourier transform is enough for you to determine what the energy inside the signal is, right? Um, and that is the reason why this x of j omega absolute squared divided by two pi is often referred to as to as energy. Um, density spectrum. Right? So you can say that this is the energy per frequency. Why do you think it's the energy per frequency? Because of the units, because it's being multiplied by the omega and that's what makes the unit of energy. So therefore the units of X of J omega absolute squared must be energy per frequency, right? And that's why it's referred to as the energy density spectrum. Right, after that scaling by two pi. So what that tells you is, if you, if you look at the Fourier transform and any particular omega, the absolute value of that squared, that tells you, yeah, is frequency ke andar kitni energy mojuda, right? At that particular omega, what is the energy contribution of this particular frequency in the time domain signal? That's, that's why it's called the energy density spectrum, okay? Um, I am, going to stop here and we can start with the an important property which is convolution property next time uh, are there any questions about what we've done